the power, or should I say, the punch of punctuation. This is really well illustrated by this terrible sexist phrase that I'm going to write up on the board now. A woman, oh dear, this is not going to end well. A woman without her man. What is she? She's nothing. Full stop. A woman without her man is nothing. I love putting that up on the board and everybody bristles. But check this out. One of those there. One of those there. What does it now say? A woman without her man is nothing. Still awfully sexist, isn't it? But just shows you what you can do with a couple of examples of punctuation. So when we're talking about punctuation, we're really looking at these symbols. The comma, we're looking at the beefed up comma, the semicolon. We're looking at the full stop. We're looking at the colon. And we're looking at various kinds of dashes, hyphens, m dashes, n dashes, which have various uses. So let's break down what we use where. I'm going to set up the most simple sentence, blur needed to innovate. Okay, so blur is the band blur, so that's a capital B because there's only one band called blur. So that word there is called a proper noun, which means it always comes with a capital. It also happens to be the first word in my sentence. So that's another reason why it's capitalised. But we'll, as we add things before it, we'll find that blur remains capitalised because it is a proper noun. So, what have we got here? We've got blur, which is the subject of our sentence, that's the star of it. Uh, the verb is the verb to need, and it's in the past tense. So, we've got a complete sentence. What did they need? They needed to innovate. So, we've got uh, an infinitive version of the verb in innovate. That's a little bit of an extra addition to the sentence. The key subject is blur, the key verb is need. So blur needed to innovate. Now I'm going to add something to the end of the sentence. Blur needed to innovate or fall into, what could they fall into? Irrelevancy. Irrelevancy. Blur needed to innovate or fall into irrelevancy. Now that sentence actually works fine uh, without any punctuation, but as I read it out loud, it may be that I want to take a little pause halfway through. Blur needed to innovate or fall into irrelevancy. What I suggest with all matters of punctuation, actually air test. your writing, which means read it out loud, hear it in the air with your voice, and naturally where you pause, where you need to breathe, where you need to perhaps just pause to make the meaning a bit clearer, those are the areas where you tend to put some punctuation, because that's all that punctuation's doing. It's creating some pauses between the phrases that we use to help the phrases be more meaningful and not overwhelm the reader. So we might add a comma here. So a comma is just a breathing point, which doesn't create a new sentence after it, it just creates a pause. Blur needed to innovate or fall into a relevancy. I quite like that, so I'm going to leave the comma there. Now I'm going to add another clause before the word blur. So we'll say at this point, in its career, 
Blur needed to innovate or fall into irrelevancy. And again, to create a pause, I might put a comma just after that first clause. And then it'll sound like this. At this point in its career, Blur needed to innovate or fall into irrelevancy. Now, I could remove either of those commas, but I would suggest if I chose to remove both of them, we might have a rather wordy sentence. At this point in its career, Blur needed to innovate or fall into irrelevancy. Do you see how my words are starting to blur into one another a wee bit? No pun intended. And I haven't got a natural breathing point in the sentence. So having one comma to separate one of the clauses out, or even having two commas to separate both the clauses away from the centre sentence, it's going to help things breathe. You'll see I've now changed the opening clause of the sentence. So now it reads, The public was losing interest in Britpop, therefore Blur needed to innovate or fall into irrelevancy. What I've now set up is a causal relationship. The public were losing their interest in Britpop, which created a cause for Blur needing to innovate. So there's a cause and effect happening. Now, if I've got a relationship like that, I can either spell it out very fully the way I have. The public was losing interest in Britpop, therefore Blur needed to innovate or fall into a relevancy. But there's a more elegant way that I can set up this causal relationship between the top part and the latter part. And that is instead of using a comma and then the word therefore, I'm going to remove the word therefore and I'm going to add a dot above the comma to make a semicolon. A semicolon. The public was losing interest in Britpop, Blur needed to innovate or fall into a relevancy. And I might add my comma back there. So what the semicolon does, which the comma does not, is sets up a relationship between this clause before the semicolon and this after the semicolon. Now the relationship does not need to be cause and effect. It could be contrast as well. And I'll show that with a different sentence. My new sentence brings up that rivalry between Oasis and Blur in the 1990s. Oasis was safely topping the charts, whereas Blur needed to innovate or fall into a relevancy. You'll see there's a relationship between the top clause and the bottom clause, but it's a relationship of contrast. What I'm emphasising is that Oasis did not need to innovate at all. They were safely topping the charts, they could just roll out their same old, samey stuff. Whereas Blur needed to do something more interesting in order to stay relevant. And again, what I can do is use a semicolon here, which removes the need to spell out that relationship. So long as the relationship is clear. Oasis was safely topping the charts, Blur needed to innovate or fall into a relevancy. And I would argue in this case, because the contrast has been set up, this is just a rather elegant way to set that contrast up without having to spell it out for the reader. So I guess the underlying rule with the semicolon, in this case, of setting up relationships between phrases, is if the semicolon itself can make clear that relationship, be it a causal relationship or a contrast relationship, then go with the semicolon. If there's any ambiguity, go with a comma and then use a linking word like however or therefore or creating or um, initiating, something like that just to really spell out that relationship. But if you can do it simply and elegantly like this, go for it. Another common use for the semicolon is to help make lists 
a little easier to navigate. I couldn't really think of a musical phrase uh, to illustrate this, so I've just grabbed one off the net. And here it is. For this flight, so we're looking at uh, different check-in procedures. For this flight, group A checks in with B, C and D check in with E, and F checks in with G. The problem is, if I use commas here, someone might misread it and say, for this flight, group A checks in with B, C and D, and then check in with E. Who checks in with E? Um, it's just a little bit confusing. So what we do is we use semicolons just to make the borders a little clearer. So group A checks in with B, semicolon. C and D check in with E, semicolon. And F checks in with G. And all of a sudden I've got the meaning that when I voiced the sentence we could tell was what I was intending. For this flight, group A checks in with B, C and D check in with E, and F checks in with G. And the reason why these phrases are separated by semicolons and not full stops is that we want the sense of for this flight to actually spread itself and unite the whole list. These are the arrangements for this flight. So the idea of for this flight actually extends across all of them. And if we put a full stop, say there, uh, that for this flight would not be grammatically linked to the later phrases. So what of the colon? Two dots in a horizontal order. Well, I showed you that phrase before, a woman... Without her, notice I don't capitalize without, we only capitalize after a full stop. A woman without her, comma, man is nothing. Full stop. So what is the role of this colon? What the colon does is says, whatever to the left of me, I'm going to tell you in different words or give you some more detail about to the right of me. So the reason why this colon works is that on this side we analyse the sense of what a woman is. Or what's going to become apparent is the meaningfulness, the powerfulness of a woman. And then I'm going to demonstrate that powerfulness in terms of how man without her is reduced to nothing. So there's a sense of a picture of a woman on one side, just by pure statement, and then an illustration of the power of a woman on the other side. And so in a way, it's two sides of the same coin. I'm going to show you two ways of uh, assessing femininity. So what could we write that might be musical? We might say... The goal of any band is world domination. Dubious statement, open to debate, but it'll do for now. Now, instead of the is, see if A is B, then I can use a colon. The goal of any band, world domination. It sounds good, it sounds punchier. Now, I might create a matching relationship for the idea of a songwriter. So, shall I say, the goal of the songwriter is domination of the human heart. The goal of any band, world domination. The goal of the songwriter, 
domination of the human heart. Now I'm starting to figure that because I've set up this comparison between the goal of a band and the goal of the songwriter, I could use a colon between them and save some words. The goal of any band, world domination, semicolon. Of the songwriter, because now this idea of the goal is transferring over into later on because of the semicolon. The goal of any band, world domination. Of the songwriter, domination of the human heart. So that, in a nutshell, is a use of colons to show one side is illustrated well and the other side. And the semicolon, which says my first phrase has some kind of relationship of cause or contrast with the second phrase. The goal of any band, world domination. Of the songwriter, domination of the human heart. When you're using Microsoft Word or another word processing program, you might see that sometimes your hyphens grow a bit. And if you're not quite sure why they grow, then this video is for you, because there are actually three different lengths of these flat horizontal symbols. The shortest one is called the hyphen. The next longest one is roughly the size of the letter N. And so that is called an N dash. And finally, this last one is roughly the width of the letter M, and so that is called an M dash. These three symbols have separate grammatical uses, so let's take a look at them. We'll start with the hyphen, the shortest of the three dashes. And the earliest memories I have of seeing the hyphen in use is in people's names. Mr. Kingsley hyphen Smith. And we always used to, as kids, call them double-barreled names, slightly disrespectfully. <laughs> but the idea of the hyphen is that we're going to take these two names and create a single entity out of them. And that is the sense that the hyphen has. It combines elements into one group. Hyphens can be used to connect words or even abbreviations which commonly go together. For example, the other day I got an email from an academic at the New Zealand School of Music. And in his email, he thanked me for my email. Now, a colleague of his had sent me an email a few weeks prior, and he was very polite too. He thanked me for my email. Now, this is an example of a word that is currently in transition. So the history behind it is that when electronic mail came along, but people still got a lot of physical mail as well, people would say, I guess, thank you for your electronic mail. That was a bit wordy. So it was abbreviated to email. And as people say email more and more, and the two words roll into one, they will start to spell it as one word. And this is just an organic transition. Spelling tends to follow what people say. And what people say, of course, is rather hard to control. And it is very fluid, and it evolves. So currently, at least in New Zealand in 2014, both of those academics were correct. And this is a word that is currently in transition, and you can send me an email or an e-mail. In a previous video, I've talked about how a noun, let's say the C, which is the subject of my sentence, could be coloured by more than one adjective. And if we put the adjectives before that noun, we hyphenate them. What could the C be? Wine dark, as dark as wine. Red wine, I guess. 
the wine-dark sea. So the hyphen grouping just helps us differentiate what are the colouring adjective words and what is the key subject of the sentence. The wine-dark sea. Because language usage is organic and forever changing, you need to refer to a current dictionary to decide whether to hyphenate two words or perhaps to join them together. Let's have a look, say, like a compound word like bathroom. Now, obviously, once that was two separate words, perhaps then it was hyphenated and people said the combination of words so much that it became one word. Well, see, now you would be incorrect to bathroom to write it as a hyphenated thing. But if you were to maybe talk about policy that was pro-American, you would use a hyphen. That has not become one word, and probably won't because of the capital A, uh, that's always going to want to start a separate word because it's a proper noun. And because also that strange thing that's happening in the sound of pro amer you know, if the meaning is confused, pro-American, because the sound of the vowels start to blur, what the uh, hyphen will do is just separate it out. So pro-American, yes, hyphenate, bathroom, don't. So you can see you've really just got to look up a dictionary uh, if you're not sure. And now to our mid-length dash, which is about the length of the letter N, and it is called an N dash. This indicates a span of time. So if we were to go 1999 to 2007, we would use an N dash with no spaces on either side. If I was to say uh, from February to July, again, that's a space of time. And so that's where I would use an N dash. I could also use an N dash to show a period of time in terms of phases. So for example, we might say primary to secondary education. So the period of time involving a student's primary through to secondary education. The N dash can also be used geographically. We could say the Wellington to Hutt Valley border. So in conclusion, if you could use the word TO to, then you can replace that with an N dash. And finally, the M dash, which is our longest dash, about the width of the letter M. The M dash is used infrequently in formal writing. The reason why is that it is very imprecise. And formal writing likes to be incredibly clear. I'll give you an example. Um, Oasis was rising. M dash exceptionally fast. The M dash there is used for emphasis. I could replace it with a comma. Oasis was rising exceptionally fast. I could actually replace it with nothing and just have Oasis was rising exceptionally fast. But the M dash is giving some emphasis. So Oasis was rising exceptionally fast. The M dash could also set up a contrast. 
Oasis was falling, M dash, Blur was on the rise. Now that's a situation in formal writing I would have put a colon to show a relationship of contrast. But the M dash can do it. But you can see this exceptionally fast is reinforcing this. This blur was on the rise, is contrasting this. You can see the usage of the M dash is so versatile that in a way it doesn't serve formal writing so well. This next sentence, Blur was Oasis rival, it's only threat. Here I've used the M dash to replace a colon, because a colon will tell you on one side what it tells you on the other. Blur was Oasis rival, it's only threat. The M dash, great for informal writing, not so good for formal writing. So there we have the hyphen, the N dash, and the M dash. Just the last point, whatever dash you're using, don't have any spaces between the words and the dash. Just finish one word, use whatever dash is appropriate, and then get straight on with the next.